en español. So el botón está ahí. Um, thank you all so much um, for joining us for our February town hall um, today. As many of you uh, already know, this month's town hall is going to be all about the COVID-19 vaccine, the current state of affairs in our community, how the rollout is going to, is, is um, going now, but also some really important updates and developments that we got not just today, but some developments that we're going to be experiencing in the next week or two. So there's lots of information and uh, so many of you have questions as a matter of fact, um, in the two years since I started uh, as your Congresswoman, uh, we have done uh, monthly town halls and this month's town hall has broken the record for the most amount of questions submitted in advance. So many of you have lots and lots of questions. Um, we're going to try to prioritize questions that are being asked most frequently and the questions that you have uh, the most. And so we're really excited to dive right into it. Um, and we, again, as, was, as Marcus mentioned, we have experts from both the city and the state with us um, because it's really important that we kind of can get everyone together to answer your questions. And um, as you know, the vaccine rollout has, you know, in some areas, people have a lot of questions and that's because there are some aspects where there has been city rollout, some aspects where there's state rollout, some aspects that have to do with the federal rollout. So we're getting everyone together in one room uh, to answer all your questions. So I'm really thrilled um, to you know, proceed and, and get right to it. Uh, on a personal note, um, in December, when we first got news that the vaccine had been developed and was being prepared for mass distribution, um, we held a town hall, you know, right after, or I think the week that that news came out. And one of the questions from uh, our constituents here was, are you going to take it? <laughs> and I think there, it really speaks to um, then at the time and, and even now a real need to, to have built um, public trust in the vaccine, especially in historically and disproportionately uh, impacted communities like ours. And so uh, I promised on that town hall that for accountability and transparency that I would never ask you to do something that I would never do myself. So I did in fact take the vaccine uh, when it, as soon as it was available and as soon as it was assigned to us. I mean, I documented that experience for each and every one of you. Um, so I took my first dose in, uh, I'd say mid-December and I took my second dose several weeks later in January. And, um, you know, I'll say from a personal note, if you have any hesitancies or anything like that um, about the vaccine, I, you know, we are all different. All of our uh, biologies are unique to us, but I can say that, um, you know, as far as side effects, et cetera, go, mine were relatively minimal. After my first dose, um, I experienced, you know, fatigue. I was a little tired, a little sore in my arm. Um, and I basically needed to nap a lot the next day. So I took it on a Friday and I spent a lot of Saturday, you know, resting. And then by Sunday, I was you know, feeling back up and at them. Um, for my second dose, I was thinking that, you know, in a lot of the clinical studies, it shows that a decent amount of people, uh, they have their side effects a bit more intensified after the second dose of the Pfizer. Um, but I actually found that my side effects were pretty minimal. My arm was a little more sore than the first time. Um, but aside from that, I felt, um, I felt okay. And so I hope that you all know that, um, that this vaccine is safe, that just so many doses, millions of doses have been administered so far. Um, and it is such a critically important step to making sure that we can kind of get back to some sort of normal. And so uh, with that, you know, we have that public trust component. And now of course we have the distribution component. Um, it's really important that um, that we roll this out. You know, as many of you know, we had a little bit of a, a a bit of a rocky transition in the rollout. That's because in the previous administration, a lot of effort and investment was placed in 
actual development of the vaccine, but there wasn't a lot of work done, uh, or I would say, uh, you know, there wasn't as much um, effort put in on the federal level in how we actually manage the, the rollout once that development happens. And so that is part of the reason why there have been some bumps in the road, but the really great news is that we are getting right back on track. Um, we had our first day where 2 million doses were administered uh, nationwide not too long ago, and distribution um, and production are really starting to ramp up. Uh, President Biden has invoked the Defense Production Act to help assist in ramping up large-scale quantities of the vaccine. So please hang on tight. They are coming, and we have very exciting news and updates. Um, on that on the federal level. We learned, uh, you know, just today or just recently that uh, the federal government will be partnering with community health centers and community health clinics across the country in order to get vaccine doses distributed directly to those clinics. So we are very lucky to have wonderful community health clinics in our own district and community like Plaza del Sol in right here, uh, right in Queens. And I'm in the Bronx, but right here in New York City and right in Queens, along with other community health centers um, throughout the rest of the borough and, and throughout the Bronx as well. And so starting about almost as early as next week, we are going to start seeing federal doses um, of the vaccine starting to hit community health centers that opt in. We're going to get more details on that since the announcement is very recent, um, but that is some good news in terms of more doses that will be coming to New York City. The federal government will also be partnering with pharmacies. I believe they've partnered with about 20 uh, large pharmacies throughout the country to help get COVID vaccines straight to the pharmacy so that it can get, e so it can be easier to access um, for all of us. And so we should be anticipating that those doses will be available quite soon. Um, again, we just got this update, I believe today uh, from the Biden administration. So uh, keep an eye out for our newsletter. Uh, and if you haven't signed up for our newsletter yet, please go to our website, um, our official website, our house.gov um, site so that you can sign up to our newsletter. And that's where we get um, a lot of those most recent updates that are out there to you. So that website is ocasio-cortez at house.gov. And, um, and you can just go right in there, uh, English or Spanish, and you can get access to our newsletter where we will provide you the latest updates. Uh, one other COVID-19 related update that we have is that yesterday um, I, I met and invited and we worked with um, Senator Chuck Schumer uh, to come to Corona Queens to announce a really important development that we were able to, um, to really kind of lock down, not just for our community here, but for families across the country. And that is uh, COVID-19 funeral reimbursement expenses. So very early last year, as soon as the pandemic started to hit our community, uh, especially when it became the epicenter of the epicenter, we had really wonderful grassroots leaders and community organizations uh, start to contact me and reach out to my office saying that one of the disproportionate uh, impacts that we're going to be having is in the enormous funeral expenses. Um, and so we started getting to work on that and we announced yesterday that FEMA will now reimburse families up to $7,000 for all funeral related expenses um, and it, to, to all families who lost a family member due to COVID-19 uh, going back to January of 2020. And so um, the portal isn't open quite yet, but you're going to need documentation. And so again, that documentation will be available um, in our newsletter, what specifically you need to file with FEMA, um, but your family may be entitled to thousands of dollars in reimbursement um, due to this program that we were able to get authorized um, in the last COVID package. So I'm really excited um, to announce that win for you all. And it's, you know, and if it wasn't for people in our community speaking up, um, thousands of families across the country wouldn't get that help. So hand it back uh, to Marcus. Oh, he's muted. I'm sorry, I'm gonna leave it to you, Congresswoman. To okay, great. Special advisor, yes. Okay, wonderful. 
All right, thank you so much. So we're gonna move on to um, our first guest of today. Um, she is our state representative. As I said, we're gonna be having officials from the city and the state joining us today to answer your questions on vaccine rollout. And um, so our next guest is uh, Ruth Hassel Thompson. She is the special advisor to Governor Andrew Cuomo for policy and community affairs. Um, special advisor Hassel Thompson, uh, she is on the New York, she's on the executive committee of the New York State COVID-19 Vaccine Equity Task Force. Um, so many of our uh, community members have been asking about uh, the the uh, asking questions about equity in vaccine rollouts. Um, and we've been working very hard to be responsive. We were able to set up a vaccine site at First Baptist Church in East Helm Elmhurst just last week. Um, but I, I leave the rest to Special Advisor Hassel Thompson. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Representative. Um, I love the picture that you chose to use, but it's about 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to tell you that this COVID has caused this additional gray in my hair. <laughs> I want to thank you, Representative though, Ocasio Cortez, for inviting me to speak with your constituents today. And I want to thank the New York City Health and Hygiene Commissioner, Dr. Cholsky, and the, our moderator, Marcus um, Bendiger, for, for joining me as we discuss a very important issue tonight. It's an honor for me to be with you. On Black History Month especially, it's important to acknowledge that while COVID-19 may be unprecedented, the healthcare disparities that it highlighted have existed all along. Our communities traditionally underserved uh, by the healthcare system have been most hard hit by COVID. And we said from the start, those of us on the task force, that we won't allow these disparities to persist in our distribution of our vaccine. We have one mission, getting shots into the arms of our constituents. And we need to do that in the most equitable way possible. And we're working hard to get the vaccine to all New Yorkers, especially those who have historically lacked access to traditional healthcare institutions. I serve on the governor's cabinet as special advisor for policy and community affairs. I think the water will get you alone, so we just give it direct, get rid of the water. And uh, I'm gonna give you I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I got a, a disconnect. Let me start again. Um, I serve for the governor as a special advisor for policy and community affairs and I'm based at the New York State Housing and Community Renewal Office. I also serve on the executive committee as a member of the New York Vaccine Equity Task Force that is chaired by our Attorney General, Letitia James, National Urban League President and CEO, Mark Morial, Health First President and CEO, Pat Wang, and Rosanna Rosado, New York State Secretary of State. Our task is to ensure that vulnerable and under this underserved communities are not left behind. By removing the barriers to vaccination, dispelling myths about it, and ensuring there is equitable distribution of the vaccine across the state are our main objectives. As a retired nurse counselor for Mount Vernon Hospital, it's also an honor to be serving our state in this effort. Earlier in the pandemic, thanks to Governor Cuomo's leadership, New York established the most robust COVID testing apparatus in the nation. New York State is now conducting hundreds of thousands of tests per day. And we're going to do the exact same thing with the vaccine. Keep in mind, this is the largest governmental operation in our lifetime. 
And under Governor Cuomo's direction, New Yorkers are stepping up to get their neighbors and families vaccinated. At the outset of the state's vaccination effort, Governor Cuomo made it a priority to reduce barriers to vaccination and to Special ensure advisor. equitable. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you have about 30 seconds uh, remaining. I'm, I'm so sorry. Not a problem. Um, to reduce barriers to vaccination and to ensure that the equitable distribution of the vaccine, especially those communities hardest hit by COVID. The state is operationalizing and opening vaccine sites across the state of New York. Vaccines are available at 13 mass vaccination sites throughout the state, including one at Javits Center, Aqueduct Racetrack, Racing Hall in South Ozone Park, New York. Additionally, last Friday in partnership with New York City and Somos Community Care, Governor Cuomo launched a new vaccine site at Yankee Stadium. The Bronx positively, positivity rate is currently the highest in New York City's boroughs. And that's why we made sure that the site is reserved for eligible Bronx residents and Bronx residents only. I will answer questions um, at the appropriate time because there's more to the presentation, but I think the questions will probably be uh, more beneficial. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you so much, Special Advisor. Uh, Congresswoman, I will leave it to you to introduce the commissioner. Of course, thank you so much, Special Advisor Hassel Thompson. Um, and our next guest is our uh, our city expert. You may know him, uh, he and I were joking earlier, of YouTube fame. <laughs> Um, Dr. Dave Choksi, he is the commissioner for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, um, and he has been just at the forefront of ensuring that we as a public are fully informed of the latest developments um, of the COVID vaccine rollout here in the city. And so without further ado, uh, Commissioner Choksi. Uh, well, thank you so much, Congresswoman, um, and thank you to um, Special Advisor Hassel Thompson for your uh, stirring comments as well. Uh, I just really appreciate the chance to, um, to speak with my fellow New Yorkers about uh, this very exciting topic, um, vaccine distribution, and particularly equity in vaccine distribution. Uh, but since I am the city's doctor, allow me to start with, um, with some news that is not uh, quite as exciting uh, but fundamentally important for where we are in the pandemic. Um, because while the beginning of our vaccine distribution is certainly promising uh, and it gives us uh, the chance for the light at the end of a tunnel after a long year, um, I have to uh, be candid in saying that we are still in a state of public health emergency. Uh, the way that I think about it is that if you're in uh, a boat in a storm, and you can finally see the shore, um, that's not the time to throw your oars out of the boat. And so now is where we have to redouble all of the efforts, looking back at what has worked with respect to curbing the spread of COVID-19. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is still a threat. Um, cases uh, remain at, at uh, very high levels. Uh, we're at 8% um, po test positivity across New York City. Um, and that belies the fact that in some of our neighborhoods, we're actually at significantly higher levels uh, with over 15% of, of uh, positivity. But we finally have this additional um, arrow in our quiver, uh, which is the vaccine. Um, and I think that the way um, to best express what the vaccine means uh, is something that I heard um, in just the first few days of the vaccine rollout when I had the enormous privilege of getting to vaccinate one of my fellow healthcare workers at Elmhurst Hospital. Uh, Elmhurst happens to be my neighborhood hospital. It's where I go to get uh, all of my own care. And I have a number of dear colleagues who have just done heroic work over the course of the pandemic. Um, and so the person that I uh, had the privilege of vaccinating there, um, when asked about what the COVID vaccine meant to her, said that it was like that first bit of sunlight in the morning after a very long, dark, and frightening night. 
Um, and that's what it means for uh, not just for individuals, but for the city as a whole. Um, we aim to have a vaccination campaign that is safe, swift, and equitable. And I want to say just a little bit more on the equitable part of it, because it won't matter if uh, we get the vaccine out uh, quickly um, and safely. We have to ensure that it's actually getting to the people um, who most warrant our attention with respect to the vaccination efforts. In order to do this, we have to acknowledge uh, both the history as well as current experiences of racism and bias in medicine. And I can tell you one of the ways in which we uh, are ensuring that this is central to how we think about our own vaccination efforts is by starting with something that the Congresswoman said, which is trust and ensuring that we think about trust as an essential ingredient for turning vaccines into vaccinations. For me as a doctor, I know that one of the ways that I can earn the trust of people is, um, is by starting with humility, with listening uh, to people's questions about the vaccine, um, providing science-based information, but also understanding that people have very different lived experiences uh, that will um, color and determine how they engage with something like uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. Thus far in New York City, we've administered over a million doses uh, of, of the vaccine to New Yorkers, um, which is a remarkable milestone, one that we just hit today. Um, but in so many ways, we're just getting started. Um, we could go much farther and faster if we had additional supply. And I'm really grateful for the Congresswoman's leadership, uh, as well as the new federal administration um, and all of their efforts to ensure that we can take the robust capacity that has been built up across New York City, including at pharmacies and community health centers and our city run sites, um, and actually having the supply that we need to ensure that we are getting to as many New Yorkers um, and particularly uh, in the neighborhoods um, that, that I've mentioned. Um, I also want to mention that uh, the health department um, has made uh, transparency and data sharing uh, linchpins of our pandemic response. Uh, we have consistently been one of the most transparent jurisdictions with making sure uh, that we share data with New Yorkers um, so that you can see what's happening, not just for the city as a whole, um, but for uh, specific elements of our response. Um, and we've done this with our vaccination efforts as well. Most recently, publishing data on our site about the race and ethnicity of people who are getting vaccinated already in New York City. Um, I encourage you to take a look at it. It's at nyc.gov slash COVID vaccine. And what it shows is that we still do have work to do, particularly with respect to reaching black and brown New Yorkers um, in the neighborhoods that have been hard hit uh, by COVID-19. Um, just one final word before I wrap up my section, which is to acknowledge that um, data, the vaccine itself as safe and effective as it is, all of these things, even our vaccination sites themselves, they can only be starting points. We have to ensure access uh, to the vaccine through those sites. Um, we have to ensure that people know exactly how to navigate um, the process of Mr. making- Natasha, I'm sorry to interrupt again. You have about 10 seconds remaining, so sorry. Thank you, Marcus, no problem. I will wrap up um, just by saying that uh, all of those ways in which we're ensuring access are a necessary but not sufficient condition to get to our ultimate goal, which is equity in our vaccine distribution. Um, we'll do that in partnership with all of you um, and I look forward to answering your questions and discussing further. Thanks again for having me. Thank you. And to that point of questions, we're going to move on to the Q&A. Thank you so much, Congresswoman uh, Ocasio-Cortez. Thank you so much, Special Advisor Hassel Thompson. And of course, Commissioner Choksi. Um, we're gonna move on to the Q&A now. Um, I'm so sorry. And uh, while the questions are being sorted out, I, let's see here. It looks like, okay. So the first question will actually be for Commissioner Choksi. 
It is for from from sorry, Marine from Astoria, and she asks, "What is the purpose of this vaccine, since it neither prevents transmission or infection, as admitted by the manufacturers?" Um, thank you for this important question from my fellow Queens resident. Um, well, look, uh, the the um, plain way that I can answer this question is that this is a safe, effective, and life-saving vaccine. Um, what that means is that we know from very large studies, over 44,000 people in the case of the Pfizer vaccine, over 30,000 people in the case of the Moderna vaccine, um, that these are extremely effective with respect to preventing severe outcomes from COVID-19. Um, that involves hospitalization, um, having to be in the intensive care unit, uh, and death from COVID-19. Uh, and so these are remarkably effective at preventing those severe outcomes. Um, the other part of your question uh, is something that we do have to wait for the science to continue to clarify. It does seem as though the preliminary evidence is that um, this does uh, help to curb the transmission of COVID-19 as well. That means the spread of the virus within the community. Um, but that's something that remains to be further clarified. But in the meantime, um, you know, the fact that it does uh, save lives and that it prevents severe illness with extremely good efficacy um, is uh, the reason that I'm endorsing it, uh, you know, for my patients um, and for New Yorkers as well. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, for that response. The second question is for Special Advisor Hassel Thompson. It is from Roland, a constituent in the Bronx. His question is, is the COVID vaccine free with no charge at all to everyone? Will the government be distributing the vaccine to everyone in New York or Big Pharma? <laughs> um, let's, let's take the questions in part. Um, first of all, the vaccine is free. Um, even if you do not have insurance, you will not be denied the opportunity to receive the vaccine. Um, and it will continue to be available to the community at large. One of the ways because of the limited amount that we have received thus far we had to do the rollout in such a way that those who were most susceptible and our, our frontline workers were the first ones to be the recipients. But as you have noticed, the governor, each time he speaks has begun to broaden uh, the scope of who is eligible. But most of that is predicated on how quickly New York is given um, their fair share or an appropriate share of the vaccine. Okay, thank you so much for that response as well, Special Advisor. Our third question will be for the Congresswoman. And it is from Ron in Sunnyside who asks, although the distribution of vaccines are being managed at the local government levels, is it possible to exercise the strength of our military to assist in delivery, coordination, logistics, general support, and administration of, vac of vaccines? Yeah, so the answer is yes. Um, there's a couple of things going on. Uh, and as we kind of mentioned earlier, we just found out today that the federal government is now starting to make some really important steps to get directly involved in equitable distribution of the vaccine. Um, so one of the issues that we've had, you know, for a lot of folks who've been calling in saying, I've been having, I've been, you know, having some trouble finding an appointment or getting an appointment slot. A lot of this just had to do, has to do with the amount of doses that the city and the state has received. And so, uh, you know, to be frank, under the Trump administration, there wasn't enough production of, of um, doses that would really meet uh, the high volume that we wanted. But the good news is, is that production has since ramped up a lot. 
And frankly, you know, in about maybe the two or three weeks into uh, officially into the Biden administration, we have seen vaccine production uh, surge by 28% already um, in the amount of doses produced. So they will start to get easier. Now, when it comes to, you know, deploying the military, uh, the, admin, the Biden administration has now announced that it is going to deploy about a thousand troops across the United States to assist with coronavirus vaccination efforts. So this is something that the administration has started. Um, and what we are also going to see is the first phase starting next week of the federal pharmacy program which will launch and select, uh, which will launch in select pharmacies nationwide uh, to start offering vaccinations to our community. So starting next week, we are on top of the city doses, on top of the New York state doses. Starting next week, we just learned this today. Uh, starting next week, we're starting to get, we're going to also get federal doses in uh, in our community health centers as well as uh, local pharmacies, and so. We are going to see this, and I'm just really thankful to our community um, because we can keep at it and stay on it because we're going to get more doses in the coming days and weeks. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, uh, for that response. The fourth question will be for Commissioner Toxey. Uh, we have gotten questions from constituents from Park Chester to Jackson Heights, to Pelham Bay, to Astoria, to Throgs Neck about the lack of vaccination sites close to them. Can you talk about what your office is doing to meet this need for community-based vaccination sites? Thank you. This is such an important question. Um, and uh, it is part of what we have to um, continue to improve with respect to ensuring um, access to vaccination, not just across the city, but in, uh, in the neighborhoods that we intend to serve. Um, this is important to me for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, particularly as we get more uh, doses, more supply, as the Congresswoman mentioned, we should be expanding out points of access uh, from our mass vaccination sites to our hubs, to the pharmacies and community health centers and the doctor's offices that everyone already knows and trusts with respect to um, seeking and getting their health care. Uh, and so we have been planning and preparing for that, you know, enrolling uh, doctors, um, community health centers, and others in our um, vaccination program uh, so that as soon as the supply does pick up, we will be able to very rapidly expand out um, the points of access. I will say, even today, um, we do have hundreds of access points, including uh, across uh, the Bronx and Queens. Uh, that are available. If you go to nyc.gov slash vaccine finder, um, you can find uh, the places that are already in your neighborhood. Um, but what I want you to hear from me is a commitment to continue expanding those as we get additional supply for the city. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, our, our fifth question uh, is for the Congresswoman. It is from Carol in the Bronx. She says, I just read that the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical, I'm sorry, company Merck has given up its attempt to produce a COVID vaccine. Why can't, sorry, why can't the Defense Production Act be used to use their manufacturing facilities to produce the Moderna and or the Pfizer vaccine? Well, this is a great question, Carol. Thank you for asking it. Um, and the good news is that we are now going to be, uh, you know, we are now are going to be using the Defense Production Act um, to assist in production of um, the vaccine. Now, as you mentioned, um, with Merck, we have our Pfizer vaccine, we have the Moderna vaccine, we now have the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that seems to be in final trials. And so Merck has pivoted away from developing their own vaccine. And what they are now focusing on doing instead is um, producing the really essential lipids that are required in that vaccine. Because as we know, it's not just the mRNA, the mRNA is suspended um, and you really need 
lipids uh, to in order for the vaccine to be most effective. And so what Merck is doing is that they're now transitioning to help produce the lipids that are required in the vaccine. And um, President Biden, Biden has agreed to use the Defense Production Act uh, moving forward to increase production of the vaccine and build operational plans and facilities. Um, so, you know, there's that. In addition, the other thing that we're trying to uh, use the Defense Production Act, uh, Act for is to help uh, expand that cold chain of supply. As uh, some of you may know, the vaccine needs to be stored at sub-zero temperatures, which makes it quite difficult to just, you know, uh, be distributed anywhere. Uh, you need to have very specific and meet very specific um, freezing or refrigeration requirements, which requires a lot of, you know, materials. Um, and so we are going to be using the DPA to not only produce more vaccines, but to also expand uh, the cold chain uh, so that vaccines can be distributed to more places. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. The next question um, is for the special advisor and the commissioner. We'll have the special advisor reply first. It says many question, I'm sorry, many constituents have written to share that the process for signing up for a vaccine is too complicated and not centralized. For example, Jeannie from Woodside asks, can you address the chaos in signing up for vaccines and navigating all the portals and sites? While Bianca from East Elmhurst states, I'm 80, my husband is 88, and we're having a horrible time getting the COVID vaccine. I would like to know how to sign up for City Field. Other obstacles raised have been language access and digital literacy. Uh, Special Advisor, if you could respond first, please. Mm. Yeah, wow. I would have loved the doctor to answer that one first. No, in truthfulness, the, the um, One of the things that has happened within the regions, and I think that this is something that we're continuing to work on because we meet uh, virtually every week to discuss uh, where we are and ways to improve access to the vaccine. Um, and what some of the regions have done is work through their senior programming to identify seniors and help to facilitate uh, transportation for um, seniors who have difficulty getting to sites. And the, the um, am I eligible is a lot more user-friendly. The state um, 1833 hotline is a little bit easier to navigate than some of the other systems. We're trying to improve it um, every day. I mean, as, as we get concerns, part of what we're attempting to do is to offer um, multiple languages um, and to offer multiple alternatives for those seniors who may have difficulty reaching the sites, which is why going to our community health centers, our churches, and some of the local facilities have been part of the answer as to how to do that. Working in partnership with our community pop-up sites, we have been able to uh, reach a lot of the seniors who are the, under other circumstances would have had difficulty um, accessing. So we're using like senior advisors in the County of Westchester, for instance, the Office of the Aging um, is working with senior programs and senior housing. In the city, we're working through NYCHA to, um, to reach our seniors that would normally have difficulty accessing. Thank you so much, Special Advisor. Commissioner, if you could take the same question on uh, accessibility. Yes, certainly. Uh, and the Special Advisor described it well. I'll just add three points. Um, number one, on technology, number two on language, and then number three on mobility. Um, and all of these fall under that rubric of making uh, vaccination as accessible as possible. With respect to technology, um, I do know that there have been uh, some challenges with some of the scheduling sites 
um, we've done a few things to, um, to, to work uh, on streamlining uh, the sites as much as possible. First, we have uh, that unified uh, site where people can go to find where vaccine is currently being offered. That's nyc.gov slash vaccine finder. Uh, we also have a phone number that people can call if they either um, have uh, limited internet access or, uh, or are, are not as internet proficient. Um, and for New York City, that's 877-VAX4NYC. Um, and we've also made a number of improvements to the websites themselves, including, for example, for the health department uh, website to focus on uh, customer experience to navigate through the site um, much more seamlessly. So that's technology. With respect to language, we do have a focus on this as well. Uh, we have people who speak multiple languages uh, in our call centers. Uh, we also have access to a language line for over 100 of the most common languages that are spoken by New Yorkers uh, for anyone who needs access to that. And then at our city run sites, we similarly have language access coordinators um, who are there to help uh, people who don't speak uh, English as their first language um, to navigate through the actual process of getting vaccinated. And then finally, with respect to mobility, you know, I think about my own patients who uh, may have limited mobility uh, because of illness or disability um, or just because they are uh, older New Yorkers. Um, and we've really done a host of things, uh, including supporting them with transportation, um, but then also doing a lot to bring vaccination to where people are. As the special advisor mentioned, uh, with a focus on our NYCHA sites, but you'll see more and more, again, as supply increases, our ability to set up uh, pop-up vaccination clinics to actually get further out into the community um, so that uh, people who uh, find it difficult to walk for whatever reason don't have to go as far uh, to get this life-saving vaccine. Yeah. Just, just uh, Marcus, if I may, you know, um, just last week, 35 new uh, pop-up sites were identified. And as I said, as we are, as problems and, and um, issues are related to us, we really have working sessions to figure out how to remedy those. And so that, you know, again, we said this is very unprecedented, but we want to make sure that we keep um, the promise that we made to, to make it accessible as, as user-friendly as we can. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, Special Advisor. Uh, the next question is for Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez. Um, it says, hello, my name is Pam and I reside in Woodside. How might we go about informing our friends and family why the vaccine is important? Note that these people are not anti-vax, but that they just don't see the need for the COVID vaccine or have their reservations about the effectiveness of it. So far, I am the only person in my friends and family circle who is not in the medical field and has received the vaccine. I can't seem to convince the others to get it. Well, you know, I, I thank you, Pam, so much for asking this really important question. And, um, you know, I think what's really important when we engage in these uh, kind of conversations and discussions is to, as it sounds like you are doing, to approach them without any judgment. Um, and that's, also to say that there's a very, there are very legitimate and understandable reasons why a, a given community, especially with our history of inequity, um, may be nervous or have reservations about the vaccine, you know, especially in the context of our, our very dark history. The United States has previously conducted medical exper experiments on um, on black populations, on, on Puerto Rican women, uh, very famously everything, um, including sterilization and, and you know, other horrifying chapters of our history. And so all of this is to say is that um, you know, skepticism towards a government, you know, um, towards a, a public effort, effort um, is understandable in the context of the history of our country. And so it's important that we approach this conversation uh, with a lot of understanding. Now, when we talk about the vaccine specifically um, and how we kind of educate around the vaccine, I think that's the part that's really important. Um, 
I find that most conversations uh, where you want to maybe persuade somebody, it doesn't usually happen in one conversation, but it happens over the course of several understanding conversations. And so I think especially when it comes to the vaccine, uh, as, as we have been talking about throughout this call, is that the central aspect is trust. And if any one of your friends or family have questions about the vaccine, um, to feel free to answer them one at a time. And if you've been vaccinated, that means that you have the very powerful aspect of your personal experience um, with vaccination to share and answer any, any questions about your experience, uh, experience. Now, why a person should take a vaccine is also really important. One, um, as Mr. Choksi, or rather, as Dr. Choksi said earlier, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine will is remarkably effective at preventing, I believe morbidity is the term, not mortality, I'm not sure. It prevents, is remarkably effective at preventing severe side effects and even death due to COVID-19. And so that is an enormously important um, factor. You know, when you go to the grocery store or, you know, when we are back to the point where we're able to travel or be in crowds again. Um, vaccination is so key to that because you don't have to live in fear of the extreme effects of COVID-19. Um, and not only that, but we do see you know, in early studies that it is having some light impact on reducing transmission as well, which we will learn more about as um, further information and from the clinical trials emerge. So, you know, I think it's really important. It's about taking care of ourselves. It's about taking care of others. Um, and also like many other vaccinations, there are many people who are immunocompromised that may not be able to take the vaccine. And so uh, us being vaccinated could potentially help protect others who physically may not be able to be vaccinated. And so herd immunity is really important to getting our whole country and our economy and our public health and our community back on track. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. The next question is for the commissioner. Maude from Sunnyside asks, is anything being done to provide homebound people with vaccines? Yes, I'm, I'm grateful for your attention to this as well. This is something else that we have been thinking about uh, deeply, you know, with respect to serving uh, homebound New Yorkers. Um, there are people who are uh, what's called partially homebound, meaning they may have a little bit of mobility. Um, and then there are people who are fully homebound, uh, you know, who are, um, uh, who are really uh, dependent on um, the, the outside world, you know, the rest of, of us to support and make sure that they are able to, um, you know, to live as, as fulfilling a life as possible. For both of them, um, we do have uh, plans underway with respect to vaccination. Uh, the first part of it starts with ensuring that people who are taking care of homebound individuals, whether it's home health aides or visiting nurses or other healthcare workers, they get vaccinated. Um, so that uh, essentially that protection is conferred upon uh, the patients whom they are serving. Um, the second part of it, uh, we've touched on a little bit, which is maximizing our transportation options. If someone does have uh, some ability to, um, you know, to move, whether it's to a pop-up clinic, uh, you know, just down uh, the block, um, or in our NYCHA developments, you know, within, uh, within the building itself. Um, the final part of it uh, is actually bringing vaccination to fully homebound New Yorkers. This is something that is more uh, logistically challenging, in part because uh, the two vaccines that have been approved, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, because they are the special mRNA vaccines, they do have uh, particular storage and handling requirements that makes it more difficult uh, to actually bring them door to door um, while keeping their safety and efficacy. Um, and so we are looking to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which looks like uh, it will be authorized as soon as later this month, um, which is a much more stable formulation of vaccine, which will help us to expand out uh, the number of New Yorkers um, and actually bring the vaccine even further into people's homes. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Choksi. The next question is for the Congresswoman. Um, it says, is Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez pushing for a closer vaccine distribution site near District 14? Yankee Stadium is far and can be unsafe for people who rely on public transportation. Uh, so the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Uh, we have been really focused on, um, on equity and making sure that we're fighting for our share of sites, um, especially in our district, which at the peak of the outbreak of the crisis, our congressional district was the most heavily impacted district in the United States. And so we've been working and fighting really hard to make sure that we get uh, vaccination sites. On the Queen side, um, as was mentioned earlier, City Field has become a vaccination site. And uh, I personally uh, lobbied the state and um, to get a, um, whoops, sorry, I personally lobbied the state. Um, and we worked with community leaders in East Elmhurst to get a vaccination site at First Baptist Church. Now that's on the Queen side. Now on the Bronx side, as many of you all know, Yankee Stadium has been uh, made a vaccination site, but that's in the South Bronx and pretty far out of our congressional district. So I have taken up efforts um, and we are personally working to try to make Lehman College a vaccination site. Uh, and it looks like that that's looking very promising uh, so far. We are now kind of scoping out and exploring and seeing if we can set that up. Uh, once again, one of the things that we're trying to figure out is that cold chain supply or cold supply chain. Um, so there are really specific requirements in the facilities to make sure that they can store the vaccine so that they can remain good and ready for actual distribution. And so we are currently working with Lehman or Lehman High School, I believe, uh, not Lehman College. Um, and so we're working uh, with Lehman to see if we can turn that into a vaccination site, which will be right here in New York 14 on the Bronx half of the district. Um, and so we will give you updates as we learn um, more about about that potential. So uh, again, I, it's not just a plug, just sign up for the newsletter because as soon as we get that info, it'll, it'll be in the newsletter and you'll find out right away. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. The next question is again for Commissioner Choksi. Ariel from Throgs Neck asks, the push from many lawmakers is to fully reopen public schools, yet many New York City Department of Education employees are finding it extremely difficult to make an appointment to get vaccinated. Do you know of any upcoming plan that will allow greater opportunities for public school employees to get vaccinated? Yes, thank you for this important question as well. And the answer is yes. Um, as a city, uh, we're working with uh, a number of different partners to um, further expand um, access to vaccination for Department of Education employees. That will happen uh, over uh, the coming days with a particular emphasis uh, on the winter break um, as a, a period where um, we will ensure that, uh, you know, albeit still the limited supply that we have for New York City, um, that, uh, that there is a dedicated vaccination, both in terms of sites as well as doses uh, for uh, our Department of Education employees. We do know that thousands of teachers and other school staff have already uh, gotten vaccinated. Um, and it's very heartening to me you know, to think about that um, because they have been such a vital workforce uh, for, uh, for New York City over the last several months. Uh, some of you may know my my wife is a public school educator, um, you know, and uh, and I know uh, just how much uh, our school colleagues have gone through over the last several months to provide the essential services that they do um, to to keep uh, schools uh, running and to ensure that um, you know that our kids are getting uh, the best education that they possibly can uh, during uh, these very difficult circumstances. So yes, um, you'll hear much more about that in the coming days, um, and that will be for the near term, uh, but over the next several weeks and months as supply expands further, uh, we expect we'll be able to continue expanding out that access as well. Thank you so much, Commissioner. The next question is for the Congresswoman. 
Zoe Beiser says, does AOC take time to talk to kids and respond to them from email? I'm probably the only child watching this. I am one of AOC's biggest fans. Will she take at least five minutes to talk to kids? It would mean, sorry, it would mean the world to me. And this was Zoe Marcus, you said? Yes, Zoe. Hi, Zoe. Thank you so much for joining our town hall. I'm always so thrilled and so happy when kids join our town hall. And of course, I will take some time to talk uh, with you and with all of our kids, address all of our kids that uh, might be watching. So hi, thank you so much for joining our town hall. We're so excited to have you. And thank you for just, you know, joining us and learning more about how we can all get vaccinated to protect ourselves from COVID-19 now and in the future. And so thank you so much, Zoe. Thank you for taking the time to join us. And thank you for joining a town hall. It's so, so important for kids and all of us to go to town halls so that we can be engaged in our community, so we can allow our elected officials know what's important to us so that they can take our concerns and bring them to Washington and change the laws of our country. So thank you for being a part of that. I'm so impressed that you're attending a town Town hall as a kid, and um, and I just hope you continue to do so. So thank you. Thanks so much, Congresswoman. Um, and I mean, thank you for that response, but also thank you for you know being here tonight. I want to thank, of course, Special Advisor Hassel Thompson and Commissioner Choksi all for joining us, um, giving your presentations, and then taking the time to respond to constituents as well. Uh, thank you to the constituents of New York 14 for joining in um, and taking in all of this really important, really critical information um, about the COVID-19 vaccine and how we are making it more equitable and accessible for everyone. We are now moving on to the press gaggle. If you are a reporter and would like to ask a question, sorry, please click the Q&A icon at the bottom think, of the screen. Sorry, I think uh, advisor Hassel Thompson's trying to get your attention. Right? Just oh. good night. Good night. Oh, good night. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Now we on to the press gaggle. If you are a reporter and would like to ask a question, please click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen and state your name and outlet in the question field. Reporters who are selected will be unmuted so they can ask their question to the member directly. As you know, Congresswoman, I'm just gonna take a minute or two to get questions uh, and then we'll get started. No, of course. And while we kind of wait on there, uh, one thing that I do just wanna get across to any of our constituents that are on our town hall right now, um, we still have a long line of questions uh, in our Q&A here in the Zoom. And I just want you to know that um, our team has been plugging away at trying to get personal answers to each and every one of you. So if I haven't been able to uh, get to your specific question during this town hall, please know that it's not being tossed away or going to a black hole somewhere. Um, we have our wonderful team and staff that are plugging away and trying to get you answers to your specific questions. Um, and once again, remember that next week, the state will now be allowing individuals with certain pre-existing conditions to have access and to be able to make vaccine appointments. So you can look up what those specific uh, pre-existing conditions are at the New York State website. I believe it's phase 1B of the COVID-19 rollout, um, but that will start to be available as soon as next week. Um, so we're really excited about that. And those are for individuals of any age. Thank you so much. So the first question will be from Katie Gluck with the New York Times. Hi, Congresswoman, can you hear me okay? Yep. Hey, um, thanks very much for doing this. I have a quick two-part local question for you. Uh, first, do you intend to endorse in the New York City mayor's race? And if so, which candidates and what criteria are you considering? 
Uh, and then more broadly, how else do you plan to use your influence and platform to shape a race that's of vital interest to your constituents here in New York? Thank you. Trying to break some news on this call, aren't you? <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, you know, I think, uh, you know, of course, the the city elections, including our citywide elections, not just our city council, but I mean, not just our mayoral, but even all the way through our city council races um, are absolutely of really important interest and um and they, it's definitely something that I'm paying close attention to. Um, and of course, we want to make sure that uh, we are also being very receptive to our community in this process. So I don't have any, um, you know, I'm sorry, I don't have any concrete answers for you right now. But I think that uh, what we continue to do is, um, you know, we're trying to make sure that our priorities for the city, that this is an equitable city, a city that New Yorkers can afford to live in is really, really important. You know, even before COVID, uh, rent was getting out of control, the city was becoming increasingly unaffordable and, um, you know, addressing um, inequality in not just in economic inequality, health inequality, criminal justice inequality. And so, you know, these are issues that are a major priority uh, for me and for our community. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm monitoring the developments of these races along with everyone else. And I'll be, you know, I, I will let you know if I make any decisions about my involvement. Well, thank you, I appreciate it. Of course, thank you. So that was the only uh, press question. <laughs> and so I'll give you an opportunity for closing remarks and then we'll say good night. Wonderful, of course. Well, thank you all uh, again so much. Once again, this was one of the most, um, it, it, this town hall broke records for the amount of questions that we received in advance. Uh, there's so many priorities that we have. Um, I just wanna say personally that uh, vaccine access for seniors is something that we are taking really, really seriously, uh, and that my office is trying to make sure that we are re as responsive as possible. Um, as Dr. Uh, Choksi had mentioned, the we are looking at issues, especially when it comes to seniors and vaccine access, homebound seniors and other individuals. Um, we one of the issues that we're that we've run into is that due to the cold storage required by the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, it cre it um, makes transportation of the vaccine and administration in the home quite difficult. Um, but with the final trials of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that does not require uh, the intense refrigeration at sub-zero temperatures that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine do. So I believe that you know once we're able to bring that vaccine forth, we're going to be able to reach individuals who are homebound um, in a much easier and broader way. Uh, for seniors that are not homebound, uh, you know, the, the next stage for us is A, just making sure that we can really ramp up the production of these vaccines. And then once that production is ramped up, then perhaps we'll be able to expand the cold chain into our senior centers in places like Parkchester and our other senior centers throughout the district um, so that we can safely store those vaccines and distribute them in places where our seniors are. Um, but for now, uh, we have distribution sites and we are continuing, we're continuing to try to get them uh, up and online uh, one by one. And we are really excited about that. And so I thank you all again. Uh, once more, we're going to be trying to uh, answer your questions in the Q&A as much as possible. Um, and I thank you for joining our February town hall. We'll see you next month. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Thank you again to the special advisor and the commissioner for joining us and taking questions. And of course, thank you to the constituents of New York's 14th Congressional District. Good night, everybody.